What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Alex Cuesta Show. How's everybody doing out there on this Wednesday, September 20th of 2023? It is episode 92. And for those keeping score at home, it's been almost a month. And there's a reason for that. where We have not recorded in basically a month. And it's not because I absolutely hate David. I do. But that's not the only reason. Hi, David. You're here. Hi. And it's because you're a big baby. I'm you have all a little, little stomach pains and then you can't record for a month. You see, this is where Dave is not useful to the conversation, but I had gallstones. I had my gallbladder removed. So yeah, I guess I am kind of a baby, but spent five days in the hospital. Got, you know, it's weird. They do incisions and they rip the gallbladder out of your belly button now. So it's kind of weird. I sent David a disgusting picture of my belly like the day after. Yeah, I got no one wanted to see that. It, a, no one asked for it. You just anybody, put it in the group. If anybody's a Harry Potter fan, it just looked like the Sorting Hat's mouth. That's all I saw. So that's why I sent it to you, because you needed to see it. But before we get into all the fun stuff, like, share, follow, subscribe, rate five stars, Spotify, and iTunes. Spread this word of mouth. Go find us on the socials. Go search the Alex Cuesta Show. And the last time you heard from us, we had a great guest on, but it was a long time ago. A lot of things have happened. We had Ryan James Gurdusky on. He has a very cool sub stack. Uh, National Populist Newsletter Substack. He's a very, very smart political analyst, uh, somebody that you, if you like politics, if you're on the right, if you're a conservative, he's someone I recommend. He's, you know, if you're a MAGA person, he is Team DeSantis, but he's a smart Team DeSantis. He's not one of those idiot Team DeSantis guys on Twitter. So definitely go give him a follow. Um, go look and listen to that episode. It was really good. This week, though, Dave, we're getting back to our local roots. And I, you know, every time we've had someone from our hometown Manchester on, it's been a really fun show. And this isn't going to be any exception because this person is someone that, I mean, I can't even think how long I've actually known him for. It's well, got to be well over 20 years now, which is. I believe you've cursed someone for as long as you've cursed me. Well, I mean, it's ridiculous to think about. I've known this guest I, possibly before you were born born maybe maybe a little bit after you were born but it's close it's tim Poss. he's a lifelong manchester township resident small business owner in the area with htj long hair and football coach at the high school what's going on tim hey how are you thanks for having me absolutely it's always good and you know like i said we've known each other forever you've been basically a big brother to me because me and your brother chris have been best friends for a real long time ran together and it's basically you were always just like the big brother, just giving us nogies and everything like that whenever we were hanging out. So it was it's always fun. Um, and, you know, you've been super active in the community, doing a lot of things. And one of the things that you're doing right now is you're on a historic Manchester High School football staff coaching over there. I want to jump right into that because I wanted to give credit. We've had Coach Farrell on for two years in a row uh, talking about the beginning of the season. We had uh, seniors on with him, the captains talking all about it, and we loved all that. And I don't know if Dave and I could even predict that you guys would start off 4 0, first time in Manchester history with a huge game coming up this weekend. So I want to start off. What has it been like being a part of the staff um, and experiencing this with the team? Oh, it's been great. Um, it's been great for the kids, you know, in town, um, experiencing something different. I mean, and they have a top notch coach, you know, Tommy Farrell, Tommy Farrell, he relates to the kids like I've never seen before. Um, and he holds them accountable, you know, sitting there and, uh, you know, his motto is dig. So, you know, discipline, intellect, and grit. And then the kids follow that. And, uh, we were able to raise some money this year and get the kids new uniforms, and um they're awesome and it has that motto yeah. on the back of each uniform as if you know your name was on the back of a normal uniform mm-hmm. some will say uh discipline some will say intellect and some will say grit and uh, we even refer to that you know during the games you know if the kids aren't being disciplined at some point or um hey you know suck it up it's time it's grit mm-hmm. you know kind of get to it and um he has such a great coaching staff. I mean, I'm like the assistant of uh, assistant volunteer defensive back coach. I mean, our 
our secondary DB coach was the head coach at uh, Asbury Park. Um, you had, and then we have a former, another head coach, you know, Gerard O'Donnell, OD. And then you have um, Bob Massari. You know, you have such a wealth like of him. knowledge mm-hmm. around this program like we've never, ever had here before. Yeah, it, you know, and it's just really cool. And I saw, you know, last year they had the yellow helmets and they look pretty good too. This year, those white helmets with the block M and just the way that the jerseys are going back to like the cursive Hawks across, like it just looks classy. It looks like this team is walking in every time to a game to go take care of business. And it is really exciting. And, you know, I'm an alumni of the football program. Tim, you're an alumni of the football program. David played up to freshman ball. So we've all been a part of this program. And it's just the pride of seeing this program succeed. Um, how has that been being a former player and you know a pretty good player yourself as well, coming in and we all had high expectations. We all had talent on our teams and things like that. Has it been cool having that perspective of being a former player as well and being able to relate to the athletes in that sense? Yeah, it's awesome. I mean, knowing you know, where we came from. I mean, we, we talked about it last week. I was part of the 2003 three and O team. And then we lost seven in a row after that. Yeah. And we're like, that's not going to happen this year. Mm-hmm. You know, even uh, talking to my dad on the sideline when my dad came, I'm like, you know, how do you like the new Manchester, you know, new Manchester, new character, new attitude. Yeah. Um, and I mean, you know, being part of the first playoff team in 2004, you know, I still have my old long sleeve shirt. It's like 20 something years old now. <laughs> um, almost, I should say. And, you know, the big thing on there is the bar has been set. You know, and my thing is I want to see these kids crush any and all records that I would, may have been part of, not part of. I don't care. Make yeah. new ones. That bar is now that bar is kind of. It's going to be a little little lower the one that we set back then. And I, I'm, I'm proud of, to be part of that. I want these kids to crush through those goals. I mean, it would be great if we can get a playoff win this year. That's never happened. Been yeah. to the playoffs twice, but never had a win. I mean, one step at a time. I think that I think the boys are even more capable than just a win in the playoffs because they play for one another. Yeah, definitely. Now, I want to talk about Josh Love has been – absolutely dynamic all year. I think it's something, doesn't he have something like 600 yards running already and almost 800 yards from scrimmage? Is that, did I read that correctly somewhere that he is just bulldozing over everybody and, you know, guys like him, guys like Manny Swain, Aiden Lund, like there are so many guys to talk about, but talk about Josh a little bit. What is, what has it been like being around? Cause we've had some really good running backs in Manchester. Manchester has never had a lack of talent in running back from Kevin Malice, uh, you know, Calvin Zawacki, Amani Richardson, like just really good running backs. Um, what has it been like being around a kid that dynamic and that good that's able to do what he does with the football? I mean, it's a game changer. He is something else. You know, even as, as a, you know, a young man, he is outstanding, great personality, brings good energy. Um, and he just wants to work. I mean, he leads the state with 14 touchdowns, too. Yeah. I mean, he, he's on fire. But, I mean, you know, we had – you know, I played with Kevin growing up, and Kevin Malice was a big bruiser, strong as could be. But this this kid is not only strong, I mean, he, he can shifty. He he can spin off stuff. He take his, his yards after contact, mm-hmm. we don't even capture that. But if we did – it would definitely probably, I, I think, leading the state just in that category alone. Um, because, I mean, if you watch some of the film from Barnegat and a few of the other games, I mean, he's just hitting people, spinning off him and going, oh, there's another arm tackle, another arm tackle. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's unbelievable. I mean, and you got to give credit always to the big guys up front. The offensive oh, yeah. line, oh, my God, these kids are, are working their tails off, pancaking kids over and over on mm-hmm. film. I mean, and uh, he, I could – say that he's definitely grateful for his his linemen and what they do for him too because they're definitely a help now you know i'm a maris guy we have football and things like that but man kids like josh i want to steer towards ruckers can we start like already planting that seed because i want ruckers to be successful because you know there's no reason if he keeps doing what he's doing coach chiano has got to take notice like there's no way that he can't take notice i want to i want to start you know let's get kevin involved Let's get him over to Rutgers. I'm already steering him there. What, has, has there been any talks with any teams or anything that you could talk about? Or even if there's vagaries that teams are interested in him already uh, in college? 
Yeah, I know people are definitely looking at him. I don't know the extent. That's something I let Tommy handle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I kind of stay out of that. If, I mean, if I could be help, I'm sure I'll help him with anything, but that's more Tommy's Avenue. Well, you know, having a podcast, uh, having Kevin on my, one of my last shows, I'm going to text him and I'm going to say, hey, let's get this going. Let's get this. Let's get this wheel going here because I want this kid to be successful in a big time school. And damn it, let's get Rutgers big time. <laughs> that's a big goal right there. But um, the last thing I want to talk about this weekend with football um. You guys are playing Keyport. Keyport's three and one. They are pretty high in the power points in where they are right now. Manchester with their four wins, the way power points works, the teams that they have beaten are not high in power points. So Manchester is still sitting in the middle of the table in terms of where their power points are. A win against Keyport would be huge going to get a power point lift, better position for playoffs. What's the preparation been like from the coaching staff standpoint, preparing for Keyport, what they bring, and how Manchester is going to attack them? I mean, we have an extra day this week. Um, I don't know if you've been keeping up on the weather, but the game actually just got pushed up on Saturday to 10 mm-hmm. yep. a.m. So, I mean, the kids are locked in. Once we were done with Keyport, it's it's on to the next game. and Or, or Keensburg. After we were done with Keensburg, I should say. Yeah. Yeah. It was on to Keyport. And uh, everybody was locked in right away. I mean, everybody's hungry. Everybody's working this week. Um, the big thing uh, this week, you know, you're going to have wet footballs, which is huge. Mm-hmm. You're going to have um, a big run game on both sides. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think our passing attack is way better than theirs. Um, but at the end of the day, they have, they have a good running game as well, as do we. And mm-hmm. the ball's wet, so probably teams are going to stick to the run. Yep. And, and they're going to see, you know, who does an arm tackle, who wraps up and who who shows up. And I, I think we're going to prevail there. I, I think it's going to be a close game, but I think we're going to pull it out. I think we're going to see a big Manny Swain game this year, uh, this week. I think he's going to be a crusher because he's been so good on the D-line. Uh, you know, uh, just, just the things that he's been able to do is awesome. Now, I also want to ask you, coming from me and you, both former football players, varsity players, how much of a game changer has Huddle been? Huddle's freaking awesome in terms of all the game tape and everything being right there at your disposal. And, you know, our coaches were good about getting us game film, getting us, you know, the study guides and things like that, the scouting reports, but it's right there at the player's fingertips. Now, like there's no excuse. If you're a player, there is not an excuse to watch film. Um, How do you guys hold the guys accountable for that? And how good have the athletes been about watching film for huddle? And do you guys have to kind of reel them back and make sure they're not doing it during class? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, a lot of kids are locked in with it. Um, Tommy ha- did send out like some um, correspondence with the guys, emails. I think actually it's an app, band app. Yeah, that's where we do our correspondence. But, you know, he sends out, you know, hey, these are the list of guys that didn't log in to film the past two days. Like we, we keep the kids accountable. Mm-hmm. And we haven't seen much of that lately. That's awesome. And because the kids are locked in, you know, that was more so over the summer because I think – um, you know, it's camp and then the kids are, we're kind of watching different films from different teams initially, like seeing where we're going and then and the process that I'm learning film, but they're, they're locked in, man. I, they're, this is something different. I, I haven't seen us ever be like this, you know, as, as a town. Cause I mean, the games, like they're packed. I can't remember the last time you turned around and they're like, wow, look at this. Um, you know, and there were, you know, game or two, we were down. You know, and it's good. The boys face some adversity initially, and then they come back, they step down with their foot, and they push through. Yeah, um, yeah. I- I'm excited for it. You know, 4-0, and hopefully going to make it 5-0 and this week. And, you know, it's going to be, you know, David, you'll be there. Yes, um, you'll I will be there have, this Saturday. You'll have his bouffant probably sitting on the sideline again. <laughs> uh, so you'll get to go make fun of him. Make sure you make fun of him <laughs> for that hair. Make <laughs> fun of him, please, for that hair. But it's exciting. I'm pumped for Manchester football. Um, I, you know, you guys have a great staff over there. You have great kids. So it, it's going to be fun. I'm excited to follow the game because I will not be there. But Tim, your involvement in the community does not stop with being a football coach. You are somebody that, you know, I ran away from Manchester. I left. I, I came up to Poughkeepsie where, you know, I went to college, met my wife, came up. Right. There. David's over in West Virginia. Mm-hmm. But you've stayed in Manchester and you're super involved coming down, having a small business in the area and doing a lot of things. What's made you want to give back and what specifically are you doing in the town right now that is keeping you so involved? Um, 
I mean, I've always kind of wanted to give back. I just, I don't really think much of it. It's just kind of what you do. Yeah. Um, you know, like every year we plant, you know, the trees at the Little League Field for people either that have passed and it's a memorial plaque or somebody who they're just honoring that year. Like we've been doing that, I don't even know how long at this point. But I mean, just being involved from when I graduated college in Little League, coaching my younger brother and his friends growing up. I mean, I was always, you know, and I never thought of getting paid or anything like that. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, it's just kind of what you're supposed to do. You know, you give back to community, you know, you build you build kids into men. And I mean, and I mean, I think every kid that I coached on the travel team we had, then they're all successful adults now. I mean, young adults, you know, at 21 years old, but they're all going off the right path. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that that's important. And then uh, in the other aspects, I mean, doing like the fallen Hawks guard and doing the waterfall. I mean, that was something, you know, Nick's part of that guard and, and other people we went to school with, you know, and, uh, you know, Tara Gardner had passed. He was one of my teachers, I think probably one of yours. And so I was like, replace the tray. I'm like, I don't, I don't want a dollar. I don't want anything. Like I'll, um, I was, you know, afforded a, and in my opinion, a pretty good education in Manchester, but some may say no, some may say yes. And, you know, I think, you know, me, you know, being in special education until 10th grade, I mean, I succeeded pretty well, you know, and the teachers put time into me and mm-hmm. sometimes they, you know, put me in my place when I wanted to be or not, not, you know, at that time of my life, but it was good because, you know, I give them a lot of credit, you know, the, the educators in town here and, you know, my father and parents, you know, pushing me along the way um, to be in a position I am now where I have, you know, a successful business with several employees and I can send them to go do stuff and I'll, I'll bring a guy with me and, Hey, I'll go over and I'll, you know, do whatever needs to be done around town. You know, mm-hmm. I get calls every now and then there's a, a few veterans I know around town and, uh, you know, older gentlemen in their seventies that, you know, no one takes care of their properties and they were getting violations from the town. So I was every now and then I send the guys over like, Hey, uh, go just cut this lawn real quick. Yeah. And, you know, just cause it's the right thing to do. My thing is you do, you do good. You have good karma. Good comes back to you. Definitely. You know, so how much influence has your dad been on the way you are with the community? Because your dad was always very involved with the community. He uh, ran for office a number of times and was always, always wanted to be involved, always wanted to be doing something in the community. Growing up, seeing that, did that influence you a good amount in becoming the man you are to be involved? And, you know, is your dad pumped that you're as involved as you are? Because I know he was he was always someone that was, you know, tried to be involved and tried to be a part of the fabric of Manchester. Yeah, like I, I lay my dad. My dad's like, you know, my heartbeat. My, you know, I've uh, we've been through a lot together, you know, being that, you know, he was a single dad for some time, too, yeah. before we were married. Things weren't easy. Mm-hmm. Um, and he always, um, you know, strive to do the right thing. So for me, it was like kind of second nature. I mean, I made a mistake like any other person in this world. And I've done things I sure regret, you know, like anybody else. But I've always saw my dad have, you know, that drive to say, you know what, this isn't right. I don't agree with this. And he pushed forward. Win or lose sometimes. You know, I was on a short end of the thick last year. And, you know, I'll still say this and I'll say still, even a blind squirrel gets a nut every now and then when there's a runoff. Mm-hmm. You know, I do it all over again. But at the end of the day, my heart wasn't there for any money or anything else, you know, in that council position back then it was, it was to do the right thing by the town where I feel that I can influence, you know, and you know, when you have local um, politics or, or local board of ed or anything, it's, it's not Republican Democrat when you're on this level, it's, it, it's really just doing what's right for the town, you know, taxes, public safety, parks infrastructure water i mean things like that are are important you know but you don't have to really isolate on just you know if it's right or left because again it doesn't really apply down when you're down this low Mm -hmm. and i feel like if you really want to have an impact do it on the bottom here in the municipal end Mm -hmm. because if you're from town you have more of that sense of pride that you know you want to do the right thing you want to do it by you know the goodness of people in your town. Cause I remember, you know, when I was just starting my business and you had people that have been my clients, uh, you know, a few years at the time that are still my clients, you know, and I still remember where I came. I'm like, I remember when I was out there pushing these small lawnmowers and doing all these other things, you know, and now where everything's evolved to, you know, being, um, I guess being, being driven is a good thing. Um, sometimes you take too much on your plate. It's exhausting, 
But on the other hand, you know, what else would you do? Sit home and watch Netflix all day long? I mean, I don't, you know, I want to be out there doing do. stuff. Yeah. I just remember when you were first starting your business and I'd be like trying to like call Chris, I'd be like, Hey, trying to hang out. He's like, nah, got to go help Tim cut some lawns and <laughs> he needs me. And I was like, all right, I guess I'll see you later. So yeah. I just remember, you know, it was just, it, it was, it, you've had this business for a long time and it really doesn't feel like that long ago, but you've had this for a long freaking time. How many years have you had your uh, lawn care business now? Well, you know, it was my dad's for a long time. I LLC this about eight years ago, like in my name, as my dad started to get out. Because my dad's in his mid sixties now. Yeah, and um, so he had the business. I mean, years before I was born. So, I mean, I'm 36. He probably had the business over 40 years ago at this point. So when I was, I mean, when I was 15, 16, I started to work like really full time, like every summer. And then when I was 16, 17, I started taking over the billing and stuff. So I was basically running most of the day to day at that point when I was 17, I could say at a minimum. So you're talking almost 20 years now, you know, and learning from the ground up. It's really, it's crazy to think about. Like I said, I just remember when you were really starting to take the reins and it's cool to see that, you know, you're still doing it and you've definitely, you know, ACJ is a part of Manchester. You know, it's not surprising to just see you when I'm in, you know, in a mower, see some of your guys out there and it's awesome. So, um, what is your advice to anybody that, cause you know, one of the toughest things when you're sitting there and you see things and you want to get involved, most people just don't know where to start, right? It's the toughest thing is figuring out where to start. And it's like, do I go to a council meeting? Do I go to a board of ed meeting? What do I do when I go there? What can I do when I go to these things? So if somebody's listening to this in Manchester in whatever town they live in, and they're just like, I see a bunch of things going wrong. I want to fix something, but I don't know even where to start. What would be your advice for someone to start at if they're trying to make an impact local? I mean, you can get involved in anything. I mean, there's so many nonprofits between like, you know, Pop Warner um, or AYF, I should say now, but yeah, yeah. whatever, it's, whatever it's called now, right. That, you know, youth football, youth baseball, any youth sports, like getting involved and helping just run the programs. If you have any, you know, knowledge, like even like our, our, uh, we had a rec wrestling yeah. program at one point. It kind of like dwindled because we didn't have anybody that was willing to do it. Like if somebody has that ability and, and they can help, you know, even at like a low rec level, mm-hmm. that's, that's huge for the community as a whole. I mean, it depends really what you want to get involved in. If you want to go, you know, on the, the planning or zoning board or another board, you know, you can contact the mayor and try to, you know, get a meeting with them and maybe he'll throw you on there, you know, uh, depending what, openings and vacancies, you know, cause I'm on a planning board too. So you see things that are coming through the town that's, you know, getting proposed and, you know, you see different avenues and, and aspects and then being on a little league board, you see other things going on there that's going around the league, you know, and you can, you can contact, they can contact me. They can contact anybody. I'll have plenty of ideas. You know, there's plenty of organizations that you can get involved with. I mean, there's if volunteer opportunities all the time. So, so what's it like balancing? Cause you also, you have two kids, you have a wife, you work. What's it like balancing all that with the volunteer? Cause I think that's another reason why people are kind of timid or have trepidation. Like I have a family, I have so many things to do. I have work. Um, what's it like trying to balance all that? And obviously, you know, you have a rock star of a wife, so that helps that you have somebody that's supportive of you being involved so much, but you know, again, how do you kind of balance everything that you're trying to do in the community as well as being, you know, an awesome dad and awesome husband and everything like that? Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's a lot. I mean, my, my wife, Heather, she's my rock and she takes care of a lot, you know, on the back end that people don't say. Yeah. Shout out to Heather. So I give her, uh, you know, a lot of credit, even though I don't say it all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, But it is tough. It's, it's, it's not easy, but my thing is if it was easy, then everybody would do it. Yeah. So I have to kind of balance, you know, I balance my work schedule at the police department and being a police sergeant. So I do the scheduling. So I work my days there. I have that, that, and then my other days I have said, I know which days I can kind of go to football, but as a volunteer, you kind of have to set your own parameters to start with. Like, Hey, I know reasonably I can only be at say two football practices a week because it just doesn't allow it. Right. <laughs> As long as you can commit to your own goal and it's reasonable, that has to be reasonable. If it's not reasonable, don't even give yourself a goal because you're probably not going to hit it. Um, 
so I'll focus on basically getting, I have an old school planner. I don't even do it on my phone. And I literally will hand write in and color coordinate meetings. You know, I will write down like, okay, I have a board of ed meeting this day, a planning board meeting this day. I have um, a council meeting. So I sit in on the council meetings for my police department. I know I have to be there this day. That's like a, I can't get off day. So, and then my son's baseball games, I help coach his travel team. So I pencil that in there. And then the football games, I pencil that. It's all in different colors. So I can kind of see where, I, where I'm moving and where I'm going. And then I asked my wife in between, hey, do we have anything, vacations or weddings? I don't mm-hmm. remember. And then that goes in the <laughs> written down. You know, and so I think she gets annoyed sometimes because I ask her three or four times. <laughs> I'm like, hey, because it just comes across my brain. <laughs> um, but the biggest thing is being able to uh, just schedule and, you know, whatever business you're involved in, um, definitely having like a solid guy you can lean on like a number two, that's, you know, your right hand guy. That's it's huge because you're able to push the schedule out. I need this, this, and this, take care of this. And you know, it's taken care of. I mean, without some of my guys on that end, I would be, you know, in bad shape because, you know, they're loyal. Like my landscape guys stay with me a long time. You know, it's, you know, I treat them well, you know, and I've had guys come and go. I could tell you, I've had guys come and go over the last eight years and they're back in a few months, typically, because they're like, I said, oh, the grass isn't that green over there, huh? The grass is <laughs> a lot greener initially. And then after the honeymoon phase, it kind of faded out. Because <laughs> you know? anybody will tell you what they want to hear. But what reality is, is what reality is. Mm-hmm. You know, I can't let my wife listen to this episode because you're the fact that you're so freaking organized. I quite literally tell my wife, Julie, I'm like, you're my planner. And she's like, no, you're a grown ass man. I'm like, ah, what do we, I don't know if we have things to do. So no, I can't let her listen to that because she, you'll get me in trouble, Tim. Don't get me in trouble. Oh, you should see my desk a little bit. It's not as organized as my planner. So <laughs> my wife will tell you that too. So that's my, my next task is like, I'm actually organizing that out really well now. That's my, uh, my top goal for, uh, the end of the year when it starts to get a little cooler and landscape and dies off. Mm-hmm. But, uh, more time. just, just, you'll, you know what though? I figure you'll figure out a way to stack more on your play. Like, hey, I don't have landscaping now. So let me go volunteer here. <laughs> well, usually what I do in, in the winter, like probably what I'll do is I'll go help out in the weight room or something at the, at the high school. I'll go over with the kids. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yeah, I'll just go work out with them. Mm-hmm. A win-win. That is a win-win. Absolutely. And you know, and I love that too, because for the longest time they were resistant to having the weight room open as often as it sounds like it is now. And I love the fact that if a coach is available, the weight room's open. If you guys want to lift, like that's the way it should be to have a successful program. You have to have kids that want to lift and you have to have the access to do it. So, you know, not to jump back completely to the football program, but I do love just all of that going on in the community stuff. Mm-hmm. So I also want to jump right now. You were have a, is it a temporary appointment right now to the board of education? Is that what you have at the moment? Yeah, it's a temporary appointment. It filled uh, Ken uh, Pate's spot and Ken was there, you know, a long time. And I mean, I graduated high school with his son. So yeah. Yeah. Ken lived in town a long, long time. I think over 40, actually over 40 years. Cause I think his daughter was four years older than me, if I remember correctly. So yeah, Ken did it, and Ken did a good job. So it's it's temporary till the end of the year, and then um, the election consists of I guess myself and two other incumbents. I'm running with one incumbent, and she's running on another slate. So there's two slates. Okay, so what is that? been like sitting in on board of education meetings and hearing all the things that come across because you know we board of education has been really big and really important over the last i want to say four to six years um there's been a lot of noise made about things going on in education and Mm -hmm. um that type of stuff so uh what is what has it been like sitting there listening to the things having conversations with a lot of the people on the board of ed hearing all the different point of views what has that all been like it's interesting. I mean, I've only officially sat down in one meeting so far, and the other one will be uh, next next week. Um, but it's just interesting. I mean, just hearing, you know, what comes down, what the board of ed can control, what they can't control um, as a board, and it's it's interesting just kind of seeing like the inner aspect, which I knew not all of it. I'm still learning now. But I, I knew some stuff, you know, like certain curriculums. It's mandated by the state, whether you want it or not, you're you're doing it. Mm-hmm. 
you know, there's certain things that are mandated, you know, just like in my profession as police officer, whether you like to do it or not, guess what? You're doing it this way. Okay. And if you don't, you're going to get in trouble. Well, in this case, you know, like, um, I think the big thing now with the board of ed as a whole is, um, just parental rights, really. Yeah. I mean, and you see people that are kind of taking it to different extremes and, it's there's a, there's a simple thing with like these book bans and stuff that are going on with the book bans. I mean, you can just simply say to the teacher, Hey, I don't want my child to read this book. Can you provide them other reading material? And they have to do so. Mm -hmm. So I don't understand what the, what the issue is there. Okay. You know, there was books when we grew up, you know, that probably weren't politically correct. And I remember a few, like of mice and men, the prize not politically correct now, right? I'll say this though: there's nothing compared so, to like gender queer and things that are going on now. I've read gender queer, and you know, I I always remember in like the high school there was always like the eighteen plus section, right? And that was always a thing where you had to be a certain age to go in that section. And you know, for me, that if that book or books like that, that would be the section for it. You know what I mean? Right. But like. The issue I found is that, you know, obviously it's national stuff, but it's like when those types of books and things go down to the middle and elementary school level, which I don't think would happen in Manchester because just the fabric of the town. But that's where I think the issue falls. And I feel like people that, you know, understand the things like you do and have a pulse on the things because you are a little younger, you are a little more political, you know, politically savvy with things. That's where I think someone like you to kind of be a safeguard for parents that have those types of things is good to have around in that board area. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's a lot, there's a lot of hot topics that have been going around. Yeah. I mean, and, and, you know, I kind of look at it as, you know, if somebody comes to me, you know, I'll be a voice for them and try to get what they need out there, you know, and, and how they feel, you know, as long as you're reasonable, anything can be reasoned out as long as you're, to, you're reasonable with the other party, you yeah. know, it's, it's not that hard. Um, but people kind of forget themselves and get fixated, I think, a lot. Where they need to just... media has so much to do with that because they read the things on Facebook and they'll read like a meme and they'll be like, Well, that's true. And then like they'll like bring it to the board of ed and verbatim say a meme. And then you look at them and you're like, and what else do you have to say? Like and people come out there with like half ass, half cock things when they're speaking. Yeah, like Facebook facts. I don't know how many facts there really are. <laughs> you know? I tell everyone there's no there's no truth on social media. If you believe it, it's probably wrong. Go research the other side. Do your own, like, right. do your own research yeah. and, and give yourself a, a reasonable, um, you know, justification to make <laughs> your decision. Just don't, you know, knee jerk off of Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> it, um, it, and that's got to be complicated, right? Because like the, the, in reality, Board of Ed probably shouldn't be political. For the most part, it should be, be nonpartisan. Yeah. yeah, it's supposed to be, you know, what is best for the kids? What curriculum is here? How can we improve the schools? Where are we, you know, where are we failing the kids right now? Where are we succeeding to make it better? And it's unfortunate that it's become such a political thing. Have you seen, so in your first meeting, did you see a lot of people show up there? Was it like a packed house? Was there not? It, was a, it was a late meeting because it was over the summer because no okay. people don't really go to things in the summer because wow. i mean hey it's nice outside enjoy the last month or two <laughs> but yeah this month i'm sure will be a little busier Oct october i'm sure will be busy because things you know problems start school starts and and things like that i mean i think there's definitely some things that definitely need to be addressed you know i mean my personal thing is um save whiting school like i'm gonna you know fight tooth and nail and not not allow that to become a pre-k Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to voice my opinion for, you know, the people out in Whiting. I don't know when out here wants that, nor do they want their fifth grader to go to the middle school. That's a whole nother thing, you know, and this is just stuff I've heard, nothing I've read from the board or anything like that. So, but again, I want to make sure that none of that happens. That's important to me. It's important to the people in the community and it's what the people want out there. Not just, you know, Tim Poss, you know, my one of eight votes, you know, I can voice for, you know, the people that tell me stuff like, um, an attendance officer. I think that's huge. And it has to happen here. We see our busing go from 31,000 about three years ago to over 400,000 this year. Wow. Um, I have people calling me probably, and before I was even on the board, you're, you're talking six months ago, saying, hey, they sold this house two months ago 
and families that don't live in our town are now boarding the bus and the kids don't live in the house. That's wild. So they're abusing the district. Mm-hmm. There's there's families that, that find out because I know in Pemberton Township, they had that issue too with pre-K because now we have that. So what people were doing is they were saying they lived in Pemberton Township when they really lived on base or they lived somewhere else. And it was costing the town a ton of money for all these kids that, you know, you'd have to pay for daycare. Hey, mm-hmm. suck it up, buttercup. I, I had to pay a ton of money to take care for my mm-hmm. kids. Nobody likes to do it, oh. but it is what it is. And if you don't live in that district, you, you unfortunately don't get the benefits. So I think it's important to have like a retired law enforcement officer knows how to do investigations. They can go out and just verify that, you know, hey, this house just sold. These people moved in. And these are the people that are getting the services from our town. That's all. It's, it's that simple, mm-hmm. you know, but I, I think you'll see that there's a lot more going on than just a few phone calls I get. And it could save, in my opinion, hundreds of thousands of dollars as time progresses. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I want to ask you what your opinion is with school safety, because that's obviously a huge hot button topic. Um, you know, I, you know, school shootings have gone up, um, you know, and it's I think it's a little exaggerated at times. I think social media and 24 seven news exaggerates some things, but it's obvious that it's going on. And I know all parents are kind of nervous about that. You know, my opinion, I think we need to end gun free zones. I freaking hate them. I think it makes our kids freaking fish in a barrel for psychos. That's just me. I don't know if that's a state mandated thing and it's something that a district can't do on their own. Well, I don't know the ins and outs of that, but for me personally, I think that, you know, I would love to see, you know, I'm more of a small government guy. I don't want to spend a ton of taxes, but if it calls for putting a resource officer per 500 kids there, so you have multiple officers to help out, that's something that I would love to see happen. Or So what would your ideas be in order to assure the people of the town that their kids are going to the safest schools possible? I mean, I think personally, you know, there should be a cop in every school. Yes. So a class three um, is what, should be in every school this year, which is a retired officer um, that now just basically works in the schools. And that's that's different from your SRO being um, at the high school. So my personal thing with that is it's very important because young children build a positive relationship with police right off the bat. So you're going to have a you know a trust factor there, even if you know unfortunately you have you know issues at home and the police come in and they have to arrest a parent or something like that kids get negative issue you know negative um assumptions about police after that but you know when you build a good relationship at school like well officer so-and-so so nice and if they kickball with me you're going to have a positive relationship mm-hmm. even if something unfortunate like that did happen to you um and just it, it's this simple and you don't have to you know really dig into analytics i mean a gun stops a gun period so by having an armed officer in school that's there for the protection, he can radio people immediately. He can, I mean, and get, you know, help there ASAP and he can stop the threat since he's there or she's there. Mm-hmm. It's that's huge. That's irreplaceable. And whatever money that costs as a taxpayer, I'd like to just give me the bill. Yeah, like seriously, let, that's something I would gladly raise my taxes for hundred percent. You know, and school radios, I mean, I, I heard they were having an issue with, like, the, the walkie-talkies for security at the high school. So that's something I'm going to bring up this week because I'm going to you – know, I don't care what it costs. I heard, you know, it costs, say, if it costs five to 8000 I'm like, that's peanuts. Yeah. five to $8,000 when you think about, you know, radios losing reception and, and the importance of that because we have somebody on – that school is big now. Not You know, I, you saw the end of it probably, but I, it was just getting done when I was there. But you have all those different wings. It's all spread out. I mean, the old uh, brick that's there, I'm sure, blocks a lot of, you know, radio signal. Probably. So, I mean, it's important. I mean, because things happen so fast. And until something happens, you know, close to home, people don't react you know, quickly, mm-hmm. you know, I've, I've been to a lot of training. Um, I saw the most recent one I saw was actually pretty interesting. It was about um, the Amish shootings in Pennsylvania. And this was back in like 2006 that happened. And the sergeant who responded to the scene actually gave this training at the police expo. And it was very interesting, the whole dynamic, how it worked and, you know, things that can be better and things that can be improved. And it was, it was even back then it was little things that could have made a difference in certain you know areas there, which, you know, have been improved now, but 
the basics are the basics. Like get an officer in that school, period. Get extra security guys in the school if you're having issues. You know, pay that little bit of extra money. We can budget for it. Yeah. You know, if you, I think if you're more transparent and explain to people why their taxes are going up, sometimes they really don't care because mm-hmm. they understand. And my thing too is I don't, I'm not going to have time this year. But me and Tommy Farrell did speak about this and we had a good conversation um, in regards to, you know, bringing the seniors and getting busing for them out to the football games. Mm-hmm. Because that's the biggest sporting event. Or even if they have like big baseball games that come out there. Yeah. Um, because, you know, they pay school taxes too, even though there's not, their children aren't in the schools anymore. So for them, yeah, we kind of like, they would feel engaged they'd feel important like they you know they're wanted at these games and they they may be like i really don't mind paying this tax as much because now i see you know these kids are succeeding they're they're doing good and you know they're you're having a good time they come out and support the school and i'm supporting the school like it's a sense of a sense of investment and you guys have those bleachers by the end zone too and that could be a section because it's easy to you don't have to go all the way up in the stands and Mm -hmm. they're right there on the field i feel like that would make them feel even better if they're able to be like right there looking at the action up close and personal. I feel like that's a really cool idea. Yeah, like a village or two each time. Yeah. You know, I think it would be good. It would just be good for the community. And, you know, that's what I try to just – I come, I pick people's brains and we go back and forth and try to think of new ideas to try to get people more involved just in general. Mm-hmm. So. so another thing I think that you're going to tackle, which is everyone's tackling, is all the mental health stuff, right? Mental health is like another big hot-button topic. And my personal thing is – We've been, part of my French, fucking with mental health of kids since we were young. Since we were young, since we were being told, if you don't do X, the world's going to end. If you guys don't start helping out doing X, the world will end by this day. And that can really mess with a kid's brain because you're so impressionable. And it starts at a young level. And, you know, I just think that we need to stop telling kids the world's going to end right now, 2030, the world's going to end. So you're telling a bunch of kids that the world's going to end in 2030. If you don't start doing some things that has nothing to do with you guys, really. And, uh, you know, I think that more, the more the mental health crisis is caused by some of the things that go on. So when I know you're going to encounter this and I don't know if it's going on in Manchester yet, but there's a push to get more and more social workers involved in the schools. And I think that absolutely is like, the wrong thing to do because i just think we need to switch up our messaging and i don't know if that has something to do with curriculum or if that's something that teachers take on their own to do but what would you do in order to kind of alleviate mental health and help you know the students that may need it and you know try and fix that issue in our area i mean any mental health issue that arises you know a lot of it can be dealt with you know and the biggest thing is communication because a lot of people just keep their feelings, you know, built in and, mm-hmm. you know, being that, you know, they instilled a policy or a directive, I should say, for all police departments to have a resiliency officer. So I'm a resiliency officer. It's like our mental health officer. And basically, so if you're having issues at home, you could be going through a divorce or whatever is going on. Right. And uh, somebody from a whole nother department, from a whole nother county could come see Tim Poss because they want to see me and I'll sit down with them and get them you know, where they need to go. Certain criteria is that we have to go through. Yeah. But I think there's something similar that, you know, probably can be done in house at, at the schools versus having all these social workers like no, you know, they, they do their job and they're good at their job, the social workers, but there's like a time and place really. Maybe they should have, um, you know, guidance counselors cross trained in certain things a little more. Maybe they should, but I don't have that in front of me, so I can't see what type of policy or or what you know could be touched up. But as for like mental health in general, I think you know an idea I could you know spitball coming up with here is just kind of how you know we police our own and, and we now have resiliency officers within police departments. You could have one, I mean, or two or three or four within each grade. If, if that's something. And then basically they just report, they re- report it kindly to a teacher after you speak to them and mm-hmm. you kind of just push it down the line if that's appropriate or not. I don't know if there's anything saying you're not allowed to do that, you know, cause it's medical, but I mean, yes and no, when it comes to that stuff, they want that kind of, that little bit of, uh, you know, HIPAA stuff to kind of be put aside, I guess. 
so you can get the, the help you need because then you're not helped at all. Um, you know, as long as they come up with some confidentiality thing for, you know, the kids that would be involved as like the, um, you know, say mental health liaison or whatever you may want to call it. Yeah. I, you know, I will say one real, real quick, one thing. I mean, speaking as a guy, I can only really speak as a guy when it comes to mental health issues, but I know just boys in general, like usually we like to, if there's something going on, we usually like to throw ourselves into an activity. So, I mean, a liaison could help, but I, I also feel like even if you just steer a boy to start, have a passion in something, like I, it could be sports, it could be whatever it needs to be. But having a passion in something somewhere to get away where you don't necessarily even need to think about it and you could even process while doing whatever you're doing in order for you to just get through whatever you need to get through. Obviously, speaking helps. But just when it comes to boys in general, I, I just feel like we generally enjoy having something to get lost in. So I feel like having those just available or somewhere like you could push someone to go say, hey, try this out. Try to do this, to do this, pro like some kind of project that they would be interested in or some kind of team that they would like to join would definitely help. Yeah, I mean, I yeah. And, you know, and I just remember like uh, when we were back in high school, I feel like there's a dynamic that's changed between the teachers and the students because, yeah, there were always those cool teachers. But for the most part, they were adults, right? They were authority figures. They were adults. And whether you liked it or not, you liked the teacher, you didn't like it. You had to respect them enough. Right. Because we were teachers we didn't like, but we still, you know, our parents would whoop our ass if they found out that we disrespected a teacher. You know what I mean? It would always be, you know, where the shift has changed to what did you do to my kid? Our parents would look at us and go, if you're lying to me, I'm going to kill you. You know, I'll defend you. But if you're lying, that's the end of you. Like, you better make sure you're honest with me. And I feel like there might be a dynamic shift with teachers right now where, when kids used to have problems, they had that teacher, they had that coach that they could, they would go and open up to. And if it was something serious, you know, as a mandated reporter, the teachers and coaches would do what they have to do as a mandated reporter, because that's where they stand. And I just want you, you know, obviously you don't know you haven't been in the position for a long time, but if you could kind of delve into, if there is a difference in a relationship shift where the teachers are less of those confidants in that way. And, you know, doing what they need to do as mandated reporters and being those adult figures for a bunch of kids going through puberty, trying to figure it out. And, you know, I think that's tall task to ask one person on the board, but if it's something that you could try to like snake in and see if there's any changes there. Cause like I said, I remember we had people, I had, you know, Coach Savitsky, uh, Mr. Cornish, um, you know, all the coaches that I've ever had are people that I figured, you know, I could go and talk to if I had an issue. You know what I mean? So uh, that's something that it seems like there's a dynamic shift there where people are more friends with their teachers and less this is my authority figure when I'm in this school. Right. Yeah, I can see that. I mean, I think it's just a, that's a culture shift just in general as like, you know, our generations are getting older and, you know, it's, like things are just changing. Yeah. We're the old men now. We are, we are definitely the old men. So if you're talking to a voter right now, if we had voters in front of us, you're trying to talk to them. What is your message to voters as why you should remain in your seat at the board of ed? I mean, I'm just going to, you know, let people know, like I care about the town. I know the town, you know, I have, I'm invested in the town. I lived here my entire life. I have two young kids that attend the schools in this town. I've attended all the schools in this town, as have my four siblings. Um, and everyone in my you know, family has done well for themselves. And they're succeeding because of the education system here. So I want I want to be part of um, you know, enhancing you know, our youth here and make sure that they have the opportunity to still succeed and still do better. And, you know, by maintaining, you know, the taxes with the school board the best we can, too, because certain things are regulated, certain things aren't. Funding is a whole other issue the state's pulling. But, you know, that's a whole other story. But, you know, I'll do what I can. And I'll, I'll listen to everybody that, you know, wants to reach out to me. I'll absolutely go and, you know, voice their opinion and get it out there and, you know, let them be heard. And, like, I really want to, again, you know, have a voice on the west side of town because there, there, there is none. 
So yeah. at least, you know, people out here feel like they have a little bit of representation on this side of town. And I mean, and we, we have a great slate. I mean, we have uh, Laura Wingler, who's um, an incumbent and she, she does a good job and she's outspoken, which is great. And then um, Gloria Axton, who we're running with, she's great too. Retired teacher has a lot of experience, you know, and she has grandchildren invested in this town, you know, so, and Laura has kids in this school district as well. So, I mean, our slate has children in the schools that are involved and have lived here for more than 10 years, frankly, over maybe combined on the other side. So we, we know the town, like I know the kids here, I know the families here, mm -hmm. you know, and to me, it's important, you know, to, you know, serve these people and their kids. It's funny. Cause I, I see a shift out here. I'm like, huh, I remember, Oh, all you lived in Pine Lake. And now we all kind of live in Whiting. And some of the yeah, yeah. people that stayed in town and live out in Whiting, we're all kind of out here now. <laughs> it's it kind of funny how, how, you know, things, you know, change. And, and then, you know, somebody, you, you know, lived in Hollyoaks and you grew up and you live in Pine Lake. Now you live down the street from, you know, and, yeah. but it, it's nice seeing that, that these people that, you know, we grew up with are still in this town and, you know, and that's why I care, you know, and, you know, I, I'd even, you know, sit, sit down, with um i want to sit down with some senior communities just to explain to them you know the importance of this and, and everything else because it's 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 tough i mean you know the last few years with the inflation and everything else it's tough on every family Absolutely. let's be honest so to try to keep you know everything intact for the kids is, is important too you know to make sure they have their sports even though hey taxes go up a little bit but let's keep them out of trouble that's more important when it's the, the big picture and we know Manchester, like every other town, when the kids just go home and they don't do have a sport, they don't do an extracurricular, well, even if it's a band or even if it's dance, cheer, they go to clubs. If you're going directly home every single day, you're probably going to get yourself in trouble. It's real easy to do in Manchester. So. It sure is. <laughs> <laughs> we've had a lot of our friends go down some slopes that, you know, we probably, you know, wish they didn't. Uh, that's just the best way to put it. And, you know, right. I'm pretty good with that, with having a lot of kids that do that. So it is important to make sure. So the last thing I'm going to leave you with, and you don't have to comment on it because I don't want to get you in trouble. I <laughs> request as a former resident, go to war to keep diversity, inclusion, equity, and social emotional learning the fuck out of Manchester schools. Because it is absolute poison you don't have to comment i don't want to get you in trouble with anything but it is a poison for the school system from k through 12 and that's where i'll leave that <laughs> so if you don't want to comment you don't have to you have a seat to i could just be a crazy host yelling at you but i'll be i'm the old man yelling at clouds right now all right <laughs> so dave do you have any other comments because you're just sitting there you made your one yeah, no, I, I I've been very tired. I'm sorry, but I, I I enjoyed the hell out of this conversation. It's always good to have someone from back in Manchester to come on the show, especially someone as involved as Tim is. So I I've, I'll see you Saturday. <laughs> so, good. I can't wait, can't wait for another win. So once again, yeah. thanks for coming on, brother. We pre we appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Have a good night. Yeah, so once again, he is Tim Poss. He's a Manchester resident. He is uh, currently sitting on the Board of Education. If you like what you heard, hell, go vote for him if you're in the area. You know, uh, and contact him. He's easy to locate. Uh, you know, if you just HTJ Long Care, you can get in touch with him many a ways. He'll be around. He's cutting grass. He's a police officer, you know, in a town near us. And he's a high school football coach. You can go talk to him on uh, Friday, Saturdays. So he will be there. So uh, Tim, anything else you want to give a shout out to before we jump out of here? No, just I appreciate you having me. And, you know, oh, yeah. I look forward to uh, getting another win this weekend. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Definitely. So, yeah, definitely go Manchester, beat Keyport. And if you guys like what you heard, like, share, follow, subscribe, rate, five stars, Spotify, and iTunes. Spread this word of mouth. Go find us on the social. Search the Alex Cuesta Show. And unlike the last time I signed off, we will be back next week. I will not have any more organs pulled out of me. Yeah, stop and being a baby. Shut up, David. All right, everyone. We will see you next week. So long, y'all.